The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support. Top pocket goal! It's what dreams are made of. They are going to the World Cup Finals! Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Koi Gig Podcast. Kathleen McNamee here coming to you live from Perth where I have just landed the last 24 hours and been soaking up some of the World Cup atmosphere here. I am joined tonight by the one and only Emma Byrne who has been busy on all the TV screens across the world chatting to living legends uh, for the ITV commentary. Emma, how have you been finding the World Cup so far? We finally are into the football. I feel like we've been building this up for months and months and finally we have games every day and it's great. Yeah, we're we're well into it, aren't we? We're in the thick of things. Um, I think it's been brilliant. I think it's been a really good spectacle, a really good standard of football, which is fantastic. Really close games. I mean, I'm not talking about the Germanys and stuff, which to be honest isn't anything to write home about you know the score lines so I'm really happy about that because you know in previous World Cups you'd like the likes of the United States beating Thailand I think it was 11-0 and stuff like that so nothing like that so far touch wood which is great it's really competitive it's what we want well I think out of all the games there's only been one Sweden South Africa that was like both teams scored in it that was a 2-1 result and everything else has been like a clean sheet for one side and then quite close like one or two goals I think Germany Morocco was the biggest score line at 6-0 and then you had games like today where we saw the Philippines uh, get that massive result against the host New Zealand you have the games like France and Jamaica or Jamaica got a draw even with Bunny Shaw being sent off which I think a lot of people wouldn't have expected um so definitely tight and I mean just finished up there before we started was Switzerland Norway which ended nil all in some controversial circumstances in terms of team choices and also Hergerberg not starting uh so as you said it's been very very entertaining so far yeah it has yeah and just as you mentioned the game before what a game with uh, New Zealand Philippines that was just incredible so emotional at the end I was like please don't ask me any more questions I have to try and (laughs) get my composure back but um it was just incredible and I, I love it. it. It gives us a little bit of confidence for tomorrow as well. Looking at the underdogs, looking at the debutants coming on and scoring and winning. Philippines, I'm talking about there. Um, but yeah, just in general, I just think it's been a really, really good World Cup. And, you know, it's going to get even better. You know, obviously there are some disappointing teams. Well, we're just going to talk about Norway. We're going to talk about disappointment. But um, yeah, <laughs> some, some strange selections from Risa, I think. What do you make of that? So for anyone who maybe is just coming to this a little bit later, because I know the game was early enough Irish time, basically Switzerland played Norway before the game. Had Reese, the coach, said that she wasn't going to start Engen or Caroline Graham Hansen, two of the best players in the team. And then just before kickoff, Ada Hergerberg, who everyone knows, inaugural Ballon d'Or winner, was out the last couple of years at ACL, but has come back with the complete bang. She apparently injured her groin during the final sprint and didn't start and kind of ran straight off the pitch, even though she was already on it and was um, replaced by someone who definitely is not the same standard as Ada Huckerberg, because very few people in the world are. And there's been a lot of question marks over Hedris, who people may remember was over Team GB for a while and then the not so uh, distant past. There's a lot of question marks over what's going on in the squad, I think. And was it Frank Kirby that was on ITV saying that she has a very old fashioned style of management? I wasn't sure if it was ITV or somewhere else that she was on, but uh, she was kind of giving the inside <laughs> track into what it's like being with Hedries. <laughs> wrong with uh, old fashioned. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, no, it's definitely not a happy, happy camp. And you don't need inside information to see that. Um, I mean, you had the whole controversial thing about Ada Hegerberg being out and coming back and she spoke up and the players weren't happy. It wasn't just the the FA, the, the players themselves weren't happy with a lot of things about Hegerberg, what she did and stuff like that. So her coming back in, it's a bit like the Spanish thing that I'm not mm. sure if all the players are on the same page. But she came back in because she is world class. Um, I don't think she's reached her level at all. I thought I thought she was pretty poor actually in the first game. But um, whatever about Ingrid Engen, I don't think she had a good game. I don't think it helped her being that 
sole player holding player she needed more help around mm. her so the manager should be taking responsibility for that as well but I, I don't think there's there's a you know I don't think it's controversial dropping her because she didn't play well but Caroline Graham Hansen obviously she had some words or something to say about uh, how the game went and it didn't go down very well but for me you can't drop a player like that like I don't know what she said or what went on so obviously I can't I don't know, you know, the full extent of it. But if we're talking about football wise, you never, ever drop Caroline Graham Hansen. And I think it showed when she came on anyway, she should have been starting. So, you know, that's uh, the manager's got to take it from that point of view. Yeah, I wonder is this going to be our France 2019 where we only find out after the fact all the stuff that was actually going on inside the camp. Because as you say, you you don't drop Caroline Graham Hansen unless... A, she literally can't kick a ball or there's something <laughs> more serious going on has there been a team so far in the competition that you've been particularly impressed by or particularly enjoyed watching I know we're only just into the second round so we've only really seen one game from most teams I mean you have to mention Brazil don't you their performance by by far oh, the goal the goal I know the there was four goal, but everything you the- know the one <laughs> I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, that lovely little back heel. It was just, you know, they're just incredible. And they're the only team. Well, Germany started well, but they're the only team that really has come into the tournament and showing their intent and showing their standard and um, just amazing to watch, really. Spain, obviously, are very good, but Brazil have knocked it out of the ballpark, to, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to enjoyment factors and watching. Um, and then I think... Generally, all the debut teams have been very impressive. Um, I think they've done really, really well, very well. They're well organized. And I have to mention the Philippines from this morning's game against New Zealand. Mm-hmm. They, they're just incredible. Like, they're so well organized, you know, defensively. They change formations during the game, not coming from the manager, because obviously they've worked on it when they're in attack, when they're in defense. They changed the formations very quickly, very well. And um, I think they're so impressive. And, you know, obviously you're going to mention Haiti. I thought they were brilliant and just a lovely little backstory from them as well. So, yeah, just lo- lots. Of, I think everyone's impressed, really, basically. Yeah, well, I think as you point out, like in previous years, there would have kind of been an expectation to have these massive score lines. And that just hasn't really happened at all, which has been really nice to watch especially for those debut teams. Like, I think, was it the Philippines goal was the first goal scored by a debut team? It was their first goal on target or shot on target as well, which was funny. Um, But they've just been, like, so good. And um, arguably, New Zealand definitely should have had the equaliser. That was not really an offside at all. Uh, Even look at teams yeah. like Colombia, Casado was, was really... You, you, you disagree with it? It was, like it was so it was the tightest of margins like it would be if that was if I was a New Zealand supporter I'd be so in pain like it was actually her ear like how are you supposed to mitigate against that her shoulder shoulder I mean it, that's what it is it is offside to be honest I I called I thought it was offside originally and then as it went on I was like she must have just been onside because yeah. she's quite good um Wilkinson at holding her run so I gave her the benefit for the doubt as would have happened in the last World Cup if we didn't have this technology, that goal would have been allowed. But mm. I mean, at the end of the day, would you would you actually give it to them? Like you're, they're playing the Philippines. This is like a historic moment for them. It was just not meant to be. I know, but it's historic as well for New Zealand. I mean, they would have qualified off the back of this, and you know, home World Cup, big deal for them. And there is a lot of great stories in this World Cup, I have to say, even if you're someone who is uh, like a casual fan watching a World Cup, as people often are when these big tournaments roll around. You know, you look at Casado for Colombia coming through cancer when she was only 15 and then scoring in the game, getting that massive move to Real Madrid as well. Um, There's just lots of lots of really interesting tangents to go off into, even if you just want to spend your time reading about stuff outside of the football. In terms of 
games that haven't happened yet we obviously have our game against Canada tomorrow Um, I'm just back from the press conference there and the big news is Louise Quinn being a bit of a doubt for tomorrow Um, which I know if anyone was to like list off the three players that you didn't want to be injured before the game we've had Denise O'Sullivan for the first game having that worry for a couple of days now we have Louise so um we were all joking that who is Katie going to be the next one for the next game hopefully that is not the case but um Initially, just for anyone at home who hasn't seen anything yet, uh, the FAI released a statement saying that Louise had trained with the squad um, but that and that she would be training again tonight, but that she did have that foot injury. Now, when they said she has been training, it was confirmed to us that she has been running by herself during training sessions, so not taking part in contact training, but she will be taking part in contact training this evening. And Vera Powell said that she is still concerned those the words she is she's concerned about Louise and that this evening will be a massive decider in whether she plays or not so we went from slightly relieved at the FAI statement to <laughs> Vera playing down our hopes massively that um things are going to go well presuming the worst or assuming the worst what does that mean for Ireland tomorrow Emma um well first of all I think she's going to play to be honest mm-hmm. if she can run she'll play <laughs> it really doesn't matter whatever she whatever she needs to do or the staff need to do to get her on the pitch they will and I think as long as she's mobile she's going to play but if like worse comes to worst it's just a case of bringing Diane Caldwell in who's uh, very apt she's center back she's played there plenty of times before lots of experience um so yeah she's a, she's a really good replacement um if she's not starting already we don't know the team yet do we mm-hmm. um but yeah per, a really good replacement not not um not a massive massive um problem but i i honestly think that louise will play mm. that is the hope i mean i knowing her she will probably go on uh if no matter what <laughs> yeah and then <laughs> she we'll hear to be on the pitch. We'll hear at the end of the tournament she had like a broken metatarsal or something like that, that she played through the pain. She'll, yeah. she'll, she'll be on the pitch. And so Brev Priestman, the Canadian coach, was chatting earlier and she basically implied that Ireland were full of like grit and fight and passion, but kind of had a sly comment in there about them, about Canada being more skillful on the pitch. Emma, thoughts? I, I know what your thoughts are going to be, but... <laughs> Um, I mean, it's a strange thing. I wouldn't say anything against Ireland to wind them up. Like, it's a bit silly. Like, we don't need the extra fuel, but we'll take it. Um, of course, we're aggressive. Uh, that's how we play, and that's a brilliant way to play. And if she doesn't think we have any skill or technical abilities, um, I, I just, I just want the girls to show it. I mean, you've got Katie McCabe, who's world class. She is world class. Denise O'Sullivan, who's probably the most technical player on the pitch. Um, and and not just those two either. You've also got Heather Payne and, you know, girls that are, are, are playing at a very high level. So I don't think it's um, the right thing to do. I think she could have spoken about how more experienced they are in World Cups, which is true. That's an, a huge advantage. I think she mm. can talk about how they've played together as a team more as in terms of players playing together and then the standard that the players play at they're all playing at um you know high high levels top top clubs in in Europe and America uh, but apart from that you cannot say that they're technically better than us um because I don't think that's the case and I hope we we, we prove that tomorrow mm. oh well I hope so too I mean tomorrow is pretty much a do or die game in terms of any hopes that we have for going further in the tournament do you think that um do you think that Ireland will change the squad up much later or tomorrow for the game I mean there's a bit of talk about Abby Larkin coming in I don't think so um I mean Vera Pau generally likes to keep it as it is um, likes to be consistent with the team she hasn't changed it up ever (laughs) only only like when they've had a break and they've come back like for example Jamie Finn she's changed but in general in tournaments or in a runner game she doesn't do that and and to be quite honest I'm I'm not sure she should I think 
uh, the start in 11 against Australia did absolutely brilliant. You can't fault one player on the pitch. They did their jobs and they did extremely well. Um, however, Abby Larkin did brilliant when she came on and, and so did Lucy Quinn. So, you know, it's great to have those players that can come on and be of impact because we're definitely going to need them. They're equally as important as a starting 11 player. You know, the girls will still have the effect of the Australia game. They work very hard. They're going to be obviously not as fresh as they were going into the Australia game. So, yeah, we will need them. But I don't think Vera Pau is going to change it. I think she'll have the same start in 11. Because she hasn't really changed things too much since she's come in. I mean, like she has in certain games, like the US camp is probably the main one. But generally, once she seems happy enough with a team, she's happy to go with it. She did seem a bit more relaxed and stuff today, I thought, than the previous times that I've seen her. I thought she'd look quite tired up until this point. But uh, maybe she managed to get some sleep on that five-hour flight from Perth. To Brisbane which is I have to say not the most enjoyable flight in the world you forget how absolutely massive this continent is and like the fact you can literally not see any lights for so much of that flight is a bit mad and um, we will be getting into the Ireland game a little bit later on as we were very very fortunate to be joined by former Canadian player Carmelina Moscato who I met earlier actually at the press conference and it's absolutely lovely and has some good thoughts on Canada and what Ireland might be able to do against them tomorrow but Emma, just to, to keep with the thread of looking ahead to some of the games that are coming up, some good ones. They obviously have Spain playing again, and I haven't actually asked you if your thoughts on Spain. They had that good win in their first game, uh, but I know going into the tournament, we weren't really sure what to expect with them because of all the history with Vilda. Have you largely seen what you expected to see, or do you think that we still have a lot more or a lot less, possibly even, that we're going to see from the Spain team? Um, no, I mean, they have quality players. It, do, it doesn't really matter what happens or who gets on with who or, you know, the situation off the pitch. If you've got quality players and you have players that have that mentality of winning, which they do in Aitana Bonmati in particular, um, they're always going to show that they're, they're world class. But I still don't see them ticking as they they should I can still see some weaknesses there that I would definitely try and exploit if I were playing against them uh, going forward they're frightening I mean they've just got absolute ballers up there like Jenny Hermoso's she just she just doesn't lose the ball like I've never seen her give the ball away which is a massive thing she's so good at it and then you've got Athenea who's 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 improving getting better and better on the wing um the one thing they'll be trying to do is get Alexia Puteas back. But actually, I think their quality with or without Alexia, obviously she's, you know, she's brilliant. And she <laughs> brings something else to the team. And she really, like at Barca, she really makes things tick in that midfield. But for Spain, I think with Aitana in the form she's in, and I actually think Aitana plays better when Alexia is not on the pitch um, because she just has that freedom to go where she likes. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see um, what team they pick if Alexi is going to start. Um, but in general, I mean, their class, I still think they can be better. Uh, but they do have weaknesses, particularly in the back line. Hmm. And then to look across the water at our neighbours, England, there was lots of English fans and a lot of English club jerseys wandering around Brisbane over the weekend for their game. I know it's kind of hard to tell from the game that they played, but were there any major surprises or shocks for you? Um, Not really. I think Haiti kind of surprised me a little bit. I thought they were really good, really strong. Um, And, you know, the, the, well, Jumorne for Haiti is just an absolute handful. And if she's on the pitch, she's going to be occupying at least two, three players. So that was a massive thing for, for England to contend with. Um, I was surprised to see Carter playing centre and Greenwood playing left. I thought it would have been the other way round. And, you know, Vigman definitely doesn't change her team. If we're talking about Vera Pau, Vigman doesn't change. And no. <laughs> if, if they are going to keep that as in Greenwood left, I think a lot of teams are going to try and target that area that, that you know, just for pace and trying to get in behind Alex Greenwood. Um, I thought Daly should have started personally. You know, it depends on who you're going to play. If you're going to play Russo, then you change the team a little. Well, not the team, but the tactics a little bit. Russo's very good at collecting the ball deeper 
and playing people in um whereas daily is the best especially the best in the WSL she's the best at getting on the end of crosses and creating chances out of nothing so you're talk, asking your players to get the ball in early to daily so they for me they played the same way they should have played with daily playing you know they're trying to get the ball in and um I mean you're talking about two absolutely brilliant players as well with Russo and Daly so and would you play them separately? You wouldn't play them together? No, I wouldn't play them together. I don't think that works. I don't think they work that well together. And mm. another question is, you know, are you going to keep playing Hemp and Kelly when you've got a player on the bench that absolutely rips it up in Lauren James? You know, for me, you have to have Lauren James on the pitch. Whatever you yeah, have As a to starting do. player or as a substitute for me, yeah, this this is Lauren James's tournament. I just feel mm-hmm. like she's had the heartbreak of Champions League, of being left out, of being taken off early. You know, she's had the experience. I think she's grown since then. And I really think this should be her tournament. But, you know, is Serena Wiegmann going to change her team? I'm not sure. She's never done it before. If she does, it's going to be a big you know wow factor she's obviously not happy with the start in 11 so but for me I would have Daly and, and Lauren James on the pitch see I feel like because their first game to the Euros as well started on similarly shaky ground I know the opposition was slightly different in that Haiti are ranked quite a bit lower but like that still didn't sway her at all throughout the tournament in terms of who her starting team was and I also feel like Wiegmann will definitely have something like the Champions League playing on her mind when it comes to a player like Lauren James even though maybe she should give her the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, there's always been the question mark over Lauren about her defensive duties. And if they're if they're going to play a 4-3-3, you're asking all wide players to work back. And whether it's helping their midfield or the defense, you're asking your wide players to be, you know, definitely considerate of their defensive duties. And Lauren has has lacked that in previous years. But I think with, with Emma Hayes and with Chelsea, I think that's been drilled into her. And I think she's much, much better with that. And there's nothing like a Champions League quarterfinals, semifinals to knock that into you. And I think she's done really well with it. I think you can really see a difference. Um, the problem is, who who would you drop? Because you've got Kelly, who's who played, who played really, really well. She did really well. And then you've got Hemp, who for me is one of the best wide players when in form, you know, when yeah. she took it on. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really difficult. I mean, it's a problem you don't mind. I know. Having. It's like it's so hard having all these world class players and not knowing who to pick. God, I really feel bad for England and Serena Vigman. I don't know how they're so so <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe if we get out of our group and we uh, face them in the next round, we could do a proper analysis of that. So one leg properly gone. We had the kind of first set of second group games today. Early days a little bit, but do you think there's going to be any surprise calls to getting out of the groups? Imagine the Philippines got out of their group. That would be just like incredible. I mean, it'd it be can great ha- for the tournament and it'd be great for like... Philippine football as well yeah I mean I mean it's it's they're in a great position but I just I just don't see it happening personally Mm -hmm. I think you know I don't think that's going to happen um do you know I, I think at the moment it's looking pretty much as it's supposed to go the only thing we will keep our fingers crossed about is is obviously Ireland you know getting a result against Canada I think you know, if we could make it out of the group as well, it'd be fantastic. But I don't want to, you know, it's, maybe it's an Irish thing. If you think the worst and then be happily surprised <laughs> with the, you know, with the best, that's kind of our thing. But not speaking about Ireland so much, I think it's generally going uh, as it is planned. Um, I think Netherlands are going to get out of their group. That might have been a question mark over Portugal. I think... Jamaica might be a little we might have a surprise with Jamaica but the fact Bunny Shaw is not playing the next game maybe not mm. um but no in general I think it's going to be the the top two seeds going through except for in our group of course except, we're going to get except out. <laughs> we're 
going to be talking about Group B, about what, yeah. what, a shock, what a shocker that is for the world. Not shocker for us because we knew it all along. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and while looking at Group B in a couple of moments, we are going to be joined by former Canadian player Carmelino Mascato. As I said, to talk things through, she is also coached in the game. So someone really great to chat to us about the Canada game. And we will be back with you in a couple of seconds. Now myself and Emma are very privileged to be joined by former Canadian international Carmelina Muscato, who has a very, very impressive uh, resume, if I do say so myself. Olympic bronze medal winner, CONCACAF champion and three-time World Cup participant. So unlike us lowly debutantes who are just getting to experience this for the first time, she has already been out on the pitch many times. Carmelina, thank you so much for joining us. Oh my goodness. Thank you. And that's definitely not true. You're here to impress and you've already done that. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think to be fair, we we're quite happy with how we have performed so far. If only we had got that draw against Australia, it would have been pretty sweet. Um, from a Canadian point of view, what was the kind of attitude, I suppose, first going into this World Cup and this group in particular? Because I know a lot of people have said it's the most difficult group in the tournament was that the kind of feeling at home for you as well or was it different yeah no it was exactly that uh the group of death i think when the draw was first uh, held everybody sort of coined it that and then as things progressed towards the tournament you know we started to see federation issues tons of injuries you know i think it kind of shaped the narrative of you know how ready are these teams actually in this group b so uh, I would say at home, the expectation is Olympic champs. You got to do better than they've done in World Cups previous, which uh, was in 2003, my first World Cup. We we achieved, I was a, I was a child, but we achieved fourth. And, um, you know, I think third, third, or, third or better and, you know, or else third or bust. <laughs> it has to be better than that. And I think the Canadian public will, you know, start to really be convinced that, you know, get that that respect that we deserve and, and convinced that this team is has arrived. And how much were you able to, I suppose, enjoy that build up and have that build up? Because as you say, things were difficult at home in terms of getting that um representation for the team and the acknowledgement of the things that they have achieved in the year since that Olympic win and also just the general history of the team. I mean, you look at your CV alone and it's pretty incredible. And then you also those players like Christine Sinclair, who has been, you know, doing it on the world stage for so long. Was it easy to get like built into the hype? Because I know at times at home it was difficult enough. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, let me be, you know, clear. I think they deserve all the respect for, you know, uh, and we deserve that. I, I think there's been a long journey here, um, you know, make no mistake about that. But I do think there's something about that consistent achievement, that consistent, um, you know, performance against top tier teams. And I think the Canadian public does show up specifically every four years. Listen, I, I wish soccer was, and football was at the heart and center of Canadian sport, but we, we know hockey's there. We know that that's pretty much takes up <laughs> the, the, you know, it's in the hearts and minds of Canadians and, you know, we're starting to get momentum with the men's team doing well. And, you know, we've been carrying the torch for so long as the women's team, the one always at World Cups achieving. But to have both programs makes us stronger, uh, makes the sport stronger. So I think that's been a huge difference having John Herdman, uh, you know, move over to the men's side and do some monumental things there, like monstrous performances and, and achievements for where we are as a country. So all to say, I think I think Canada soccer you know, I hope they get to sort out their federation issues. I think that kind of hurts the brand a little bit, you know, when people are looking at the sport as a whole, you know, these women will achieve amazing things and continue to do that every quadrennial. But, you know, we still need our federation to sort of jump on that equal pay bandwagon and start to, it's not even a bandwagon, it's just the right thing to do. And I think once we start to do that, maybe the sport starts to get a little bit more credibility in, in the Canadian public and society. So I hope all those things start to to sort themselves out and, and we can start to, well, continue to build this this story. Well, Emma, you know all about doing that from an Irish I context. Say, if if I you was, want any yes. advice, give me a call. <laughs> you literally did that. So I would love to shift gears and talk about your <laughs> how you led your federation to where they are right now. So I, I know, you know there's a lot of experience and 
for real. Well, what do you think? <laughs> I just chat. think, well, personally, our, our federation just realized it was just the right thing to do. And uh, personally, I think that yours will see that eventually. <laughs> um, okay. and, and you're right. They do deserve it. They deserve that credit. They, they deserve to be up there. Um, especially after everything you've won. I, I, you know, we fought for things. It wasn't about accolades and things like that. It was for the next generation. And I think that's where a lot of federations or, or players are going wrong because if you're not fighting for something else or someone else, it makes it extremely difficult. And you've seen a breakdown with other teams because maybe it's a bit personal, but um, I think you guys are going about it the right way. And I really hope that you get what you deserve. No, I appreciate that. And, and to your point, exactly that. It's it's always about the next gen. And I think they're very clear on their mission. It's, you know, yes, we've achieved, but look at us and leave it better. Come on, than we found it and we can't keep going backwards. So I'm with you there, Emma, for sure. Mm, that's definitely that, a cause that we support. <laughs> do, do you think this is a little bit of added pressure for, for the girls? All of that that's going on, you know, if they don't do well in this World Cup, will that leave it a little bit stale? in regards to that fight? That's an interesting question. I, to your point, I don't think it's about achievement. I really don't. I think it is that there's a broader conversation around how, you know, Federation money is spent, how they're actually marketing and what the commercial invest, where, where are those, who, who's making those decisions and are they in line with our values? Yeah. You know, really, and I think that transparency has been missing for a long time with the Federation. And um, so I, I do think it is about the conditions, first and foremost, really. Mm -hmm. And then I think equal pay is now becoming a standard and is right amongst those those asks. But it's it's going to be about leaving the sport like we our youth, our youth system, for example, like it's non-existent mm -hmm. <laughs> in the sense that a lot of the funding's been cut. And then, you know, a lot of our senior players are looking at that and saying, where are these next players coming from? What are we doing? What is yeah. the plan? And you want to give that, you know, that assurance to to everybody that we we know what we're up to. And I, I think we're just a little bit off track at the minute. And then to I suppose take that on, because as you say, like the there is a lot riding on the sense of doing well in this World Cup will give the team a massive boost in terms of like personally, I mean, it's amazing to succeed in a World Cup, but also to get more people on board with the cause at home for say our Irish viewers who maybe don't watch a whole lot of the Canadian team what can they expect from this Canadian team tomorrow when we face them here in Perth who's playing what's the team <laughs> yeah well Jesse I'm Fleming is in who is out <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, this is a great discussion. Yeah, we, you know, I, my personal pick is that, you know, Lawrence is up against McCabe. I think the world needs to see that matchup. <laughs> I think that, that'll be a change from the first uh, lineup where she was on the left and Jade Revere was on the right. So that would be a big difference and Chapman in the back. So I do have a back line change. Uh, midfield, yeah, Sinclair out, Jesse in if she is able to get maximum minutes based on her return to play. So 45 to 60 for Jesse. Start with the player who can break down and break down blocks and and work between lines and and play make and and achieve those key passes. And we know she can score. If she can score. So let, let's hope for that. And then the front three. You know, we look at Deanne Rose, who unfortunately didn't get to play a lot with Reading. You know, she didn't get a lot of club minutes coming in, but it was almost a, a miracle that she was back from her Achilles tendon. So all credit to her. Happy that she's healthy. Um, I don't think she's at 100 uh, percent, to be fair to her. And Chloe Lacasse was a spark. So, you know, Chloe Lacasse comes in just that recent Arsenal transfer from Benfica. I think she's she's in form. She's done great. I love Heidema. I'm going to put my name on Heidema. Whether she plays on number nine or out wide, we will see. Uh, and if she's out wide, then VN starts, possibly. Okay. So that's my so, anticipation. Few few changes from the first game. We were just discussing before we came on that the likelihood of Ireland changing may not be all that strong unless Louise Quinn can play. But then we said even if she's on crutches, she'll probably be on the pitch anyways. Um, what do you expect from that battle then between Ashley Lawrence and Katie McCabe? 
Well, I think it's going to be a game of cat and mouse, truly, about the height of the wing back. I mean, if she's pinned back into that back five, then I think Ash will uh, live as high as she wants to and become her sort of winger identity. And I think she loves to roll inside as well. She's super comfortable in central spaces. So I think it'll be a nightmare uh, to defend, if I'm honest. But I also think that I think Ireland knows that they, they need to win. So I think there's a risk assessment here where if Katie McCabe plays a little higher, then, you know, game on. And what does that do to the, the players behind the ball? Does Ashley still go? Do you keep Quinn back defending the space that Ashley's left? Like, it's it's going to be a very cool tactical battle. Um, and I hope Kadisha's healthy. I know the tweet has gone around about Kadisha Buchanan, the right center back mm -hmm. who would be directly responsible for McCabe if, if she does get into the channel. So I hope she's ready to go as well. My heart dropped when I saw that. I was like, huh, what's going on here? I, I, I literally don't know. <laughs> I felt like when we're like both sides after seeing those training videos were a little on edge about some fairly central players. Um, currently, before we came on, we asked some of our listeners for any questions. And this one, I think you are particularly apt to answer. It's from at Kim2005 underscore. It's how much of an impact will Jesse Fleming have for Canada and will it really affect the chances of Ireland getting a result? Uh, big time. I, I have some interesting information around Jesse's impact. And, uh, you know, she played every single match in Tokyo, literally every minute of every match. And then Canada had 25 games post Tokyo leading in to this World Cup. And she was on the pitch for all 25 games, was subbed up only six times. And wow. she was part of every one of their 14 wins in those 25 games so when you talk they've never had to play without her if you want to put it that way um and i think that that speaks volumes of her impact i, I don't think there's somebody who creates and uses space better than jesse fleming you know especially well let's just say for canada i'm not going to make all grandiose you know that i know there's a lot of great midfielders in the game i'm not going to be pro canadian here but i think she is one of the best in the world so she will she will know how to break down a block and give us our best chance to do that, uh, especially centrally. And she knows how to roll wide into overload spaces. So, yeah, I, she's pivotal. If she can play 45, let's do it. <laughs> let's get her on for 45. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting, Fleming, isn't it? I, I, I really rate her as well, but she doesn't get a lot of time with Chelsea either. Like she wouldn't be first on the team sheet. Um, and I know Chelsea are flushed with players, but um, it's always surprised me because she's so she's such an intricate player. I think she's going to cause us problems because of that. She knows how to get in, in between the lines. What Australia mm -hmm. missed basically against us is a player like Fleming. So, well, obviously, I'm not happy to see her playing. <laughs> But... <laughs> that's fair i can understand your perspective I'm, go I'm gonna go with the fact she hasn't played much for chelsea <laughs> there you go. Okay. well you know what that's 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 fine i mean you know she did she, actually that's a good point she chose i know for a fact she chose chelsea for for the environment she knew she would become a better player in general but also for canada being in that environment so Credit to her for enduring, you know, not playing 90s. And maybe that'll change at some point in her career. But she's gotten better for being there. So it's been cool to watch. So you don't think the fact that she's been at Chelsea has harmed her in any way in terms of not getting that regular game time in the same way that she may have at another club? No, I think Priority said that when she arrived there was about development. And I think she was really clear on on that. She wanted to be the best player she could be. And, and that's one of the best environments in the world. And I know without having our own league in Canada, you know, I, I have to throw that in this discussion. Without having that, you, you know, players are seeking environments where they can be at their best. And there will be times where 90 minutes where she can get um, probably a hundred other clubs um, will be a priority and, and maybe that will be the play. But, but right now I see she's benefited from being there. For us after the Australia game, like I think there was a lot of people that came out with a positive feeling of it just because of how we played and the fact we were able to play that way for so long in those last 10, 15 minutes, not mm. to go over it again, because I think the whole of Ireland is traumatized by it, but we were so close to getting a goal. Um, what was the general reaction and feeling at home after the Nigeria game? Because obviously, I think you guys really expected to get a result, and then it ended up being much more of a slog. Did it kind of? Do you think it injected something into this team, or did it instill a little bit of worry in fans in terms of what's actually possible for this group in the World Cup? Because it wouldn't be the only team either. Like a lot of teams kind of just slid by an opposition that they should have beaten quite well. You know, you saw it with England and other teams as well. 
Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's a great point. I don't mean to harp on, you know, the world cup and anything can happen. I think we all see that. We all get that. Um, I think Canadians were slightly underwhelmed and I think meaning that they wanted to see a more dangerous Canadian team in open play specifically we know they can score on set pieces we know midfielders have taken the burden off of the top three with Julia Grosso who can score Sinclair who's now a midfielder can score and, and you know they weren't able to do that and and I think Canadian Canadians are getting a little bit tired of this narrative we haven't scored an open play goal in eight in eight games you know for example and that becomes difficult but you know there are good moments I mean as a player as a coach now I I understand that it is a process and they are going to grow into a tournament but they have two games to do so under the highest pressure so you know <laughs> we can talk about growing all we want we know we have to get results so I think people were underwhelmed they wanted to see more and I think the injuries and the lack of club minutes for some players have were, were a little bit on display uh, I'm hoping they can turn that around within the five days that they've had and and I have all the faith that they can as a, as a Canadian I really do uh, and I think they're going to be up for the challenge against Ireland Hopefully not too up for it though. <laughs> for it, huh? <laughs> I almost forgot what podcast I was on for a second. Whoa. <laughs> oh no, so I'm just saying I'm just surprised it's not Emma jumping in with the like smart comments. Normally that's what I'm, her I'm surprised Emma hasn't come at me a little bit here. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm I'm keeping it. It's it's building up. It's building up. It's like <laughs> No, like I, I mean, I've played against. We've probably played against each other a couple of times, Carmelina. Were, were you the one that kicked me in in the? <laughs> in the <laughs> <bus>? <laughs> I think it was like 2014 Cyprus. I like. I don't even know if I played that game, so I have to look back because there our history is not that deep. It's crazy. It's uh, the art of time wasting. I think I was the queen of, but um, no, no, no. We know the Canadian sides. They've got lots and lots of good, good players. And to be honest, when we talk about the group of death, we, well, I personally didn't consider it the group of death because we're playing against teams that are physical, that are direct that we can defend against. So for us, well, for me, uh, I was happy enough to be in this group and not uh, Japan or Spain or, you know, the, the very, very uh, technical, skillful players. But we have played Canada a few times and they have been close games. We frustrated you guys a lot. <laughs> uh, time wasting, for example. Um, but obviously Ireland are in a better place now uh, with me not in the team. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> No, they're in no, a wouldn't go place. that far, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> they're in a much better place. Um, and I think it's going to be a really good game. And I think how we finish the game against Australia is going to give us a bit of confidence. And I'm really looking forward to that. And of course, I'm looking forward to the Ashley Lawrence, Katie McCabe battle. I think that's going to be. Oh, no, maybe yeah. maybe she goes with the same back four. It, it's still oh, yeah, literally. Maybe, maybe it, she'll so. keep Ashley away from Katie, and then it'll be a, a battle of the of the the wings who gets forward, as you said. But um, I think it's going to be really good, really interesting one. Yeah, absolutely. I I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think this is um this is going to be a, a group B classic as well. I think it's going to determine the fate of everything. I know it depends on other results, but. You know, a tie for either one of these teams is just not enough. So it's got to be all in. Absolutely. That doesn't scare me at all, the idea of it being all in. <laughs> one of those ones that it could go one way or the other for both teams. Um. So if there was a player on the Canadian squad, Carmelina, that you would say for people to watch out that maybe doesn't have the name of uh, Jesse Fleming or Buchanan or even a Christine Sinclair for people over here, who would you pick out as a one to watch for Irish fans tomorrow? That's a, it's a great question. I would throw Lawrence into that. I think people know her, the consciousness she's, she's at the highest level, but Vanessa Gilles, the left-sided center back uh, plays for Lyon, formerly angel city that I think that trade was completed. Um, she is a late bloomer in the sport. She started playing when she was 16 her story is literally incredible. Um, she's come on the international scene, persisted her way through club football throughout many countries, is now playing at the highest level with Lyon and is just an absolute powerhouse. Um, she does play on the left side. She's been known to score some unbelievable uh, goals on corners. She's just like undefendable on corners. So I hope that we get to see, you know, sorry, I remember the podcast I'm on, but I, I hope <laughs> 
expecting that, uh, you know, on display tomorrow. But Vanessa Gilles, if you don't know about her, look into her. She's fantastic. And she's a great ambassador for Canada. Yeah, I, I've done a couple of games in the French League and she scored against, I think, a header against PSG. And I just thought I had to Google her. I was like, who is this girl? What? She's Canadian. <laughs> I've never heard of this. Yeah, she's she is a powerhouse, as you say. She's very, very strong. Uh, we have a few strong defenders as well in the air. So that'll be another good battle. <laughs> just saying. Right. Just saying. Oh, you're right. <laughs> uh, totally right. The player I'm looking forward to seeing is is Grosso because I've done a good few um, Italian games as well and she's doing really well for Juventus. Really nice player, quite similar to our uh, Denise O'Sullivan type style play. So I think uh, it's going to be a good match all around the pitch really if you think about it. Yeah, I love that you picked Grosso as well, because I think specifically, I know she's not the only left footed player in the game, but she's kind of like that maverick, that left footed, you know, no one's like her in the Canadian system. Um, I also, as much as Fleming is somebody we we don't like to see off the pitch, I think Grosso is, is invaluable as well for as much as we can keep her out there physically keeping her fresh. Uh, but her left foot is special and she 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 allows the left side of our triangles to, to come alive. Um, so I'm a big fan. I totally agree with you on that one. Yeah, she doesn't like a tackle though, so you know, <laughs> might not like playing against us. It's <laughs> a good point, actually. Good pick up. <laughs> that's a very that's, good that's what all the Irish girls with they don't like a tackle. She doesn't like a tackle. <laughs> Common thread. <laughs> well, they're not talking about me, so that's good. <laughs> no. So Carmelina, as a final question, and you can put all your biases on the table, we totally know what we were getting ourselves in for when you, we asked you to come on the podcast. What is your prediction for tomorrow evening? My prediction, it's going to be as it has been. I'm going to rely on history here. Uh, unbelievable, mar like low margin, small margin game, one nothing Canada. Okay, and Emma, <laughs> what are you going for? I'm going to say 2-1 Ireland, of course. Of yes. course. Yes. Two, one, I think I you're both right. I think it is going to be an incredibly tight game. And I hope it's a tight game and that like the way the two sides have been set up so far, it feels like it's going to be a really interesting one with so much on the table as well. And that's exactly why we want to be at World Cups. This is where we want to be. Uh Carmelina, thank you so much for in joining us tonight. Uh I hope we're still able to be friends after tomorrow if I do see you wandering <laughs> around the press conference. I thought it was funny after I came out of the Ireland Australia games, a lot of the Australian journalists like came over and gave me a hug and I was like, God, this is so depressing. <laughs> it would almost be better if you guys ignored me <laughs> rather than <laughs> I'll remember you said that. If I see yeah. you and I don't I, you know why <laughs> <laughs> now I know why and <laughs> uh, well thank you everyone for tuning in today and listening to this World Cup preview for Ireland versus Canada I believe that game is kicking up at one o'clock at home so nice little lunch break for anyone who is looking for it and the Koi Gig podcast and Off the Ball is in association with Cadbury official snack partner to Republic of Ireland women's national team we will be back of course with the podcast after the game where uh, hopefully we're all smiles and laughs uh, afterwards as well if you want to get any of your thoughts or comments into us you can get us on Twitter at the Koi Gig pod while it is still there it's not actually even called Twitter anymore is it? it's called X or something or else you can email them to us on the Koi Gig pod at offtheball.com. Thank you so much for tuning in and hopefully everyone at home is able to enjoy the game. The Koi Gig pod on OTB in association with Cadbury, official snack partner of the Republic of Ireland women's national team.